Welcome to Historic Bonaventure Cemetery. The cemetery is located three miles from the heart of Savannah, Georgia, leaving it overlooked at times by the many tourists who come to the town looking for beautiful locations to visit. The historic district draws them in with its many squares and monuments so that guests do not venture outside of attractions like City Market and Forsyth Park. The cemetery is most noted for the live oak trees with Spanish moss hanging from their branches that line the pathways and sections that make up Bonaventure. Along with the towering trees, the cemetery is alive with color as flowers like azaleas and camellias bloom in the spring and summer. Located on the Wilmington River, tourists are greeted by scenic views of the monuments along Bonaventure's 100 acres. Once reaching the edge of the property, the river provides them with a picturesque backdrop. Bonaventure's history is not just that of a cemetery. It begins in 1762 with John Mulrine and his family purchasing the land and founding the Bonaventure Plantation. Bonaventure, which means good fortune in French, would play a pivotal role for both the Loyalists and Patriots during the Revolutionary War. After the war, the property changed hands three times before coming into the possession of the city of Savannah, which still owns the land today. More recently, Bonaventure was featured in John Barron's novel, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Featured on the cover in a photo taken by Jack Lay, the book made the Bird Girl statue a popular culture icon and, as a result, is no longer located in the cemetery. Parts of the movie adaptation of the book, directed by Clint Eastwood, were shot in the cemetery and featured monuments such as the Morgan Angel located inside the gates. Bonaventure's many charms include the various monuments, the trees, and the wildlife that all coexist to make the cemetery a magnificent Victorian garden. Bonaventure can even be compared to cemeteries such as Paris's Pierre Lachaise where Jim Morrison of the popular band The Doors is buried. Before looking at the cemetery today, a glance backward is necessary to get a full understanding of the land that makes up Bonaventure. In the early 1760s, John Mulrine began purchasing land in the new colony of Georgia. On March 4, 1764, Mulrine notified the Georgia Council that he and his family were moving to the new colony. The land they chose to live on was a tract along the St. Augustine Creek, some three and a half miles away from Savannah. The Mulrines then began purchasing land in the Reynolds Ward and the nearby village of Thunderbolt. He continued to purchase property from small landowners until the new plantation reached 600 acres. More significant was that John Mulrine placed the property in the name of his wife, Claudia, something unheard of at this time. Mulrine would become an active political participant in Georgia. During his time in the colony, he served as Surveyor of Roads, Justice of the Peace, and an elected official in the Representative Assembly of the Georgia Council. Mulrine would also be contracted to rebuild the Tybee Island Lighthouse in 1769, completing the structure in 1773. Soon, the standing of the Mulrines would begin to decline. With the rumblings of rebellion beginning to surface in the colony, the Mulrines felt it best to remain loyal to the Crown and Governor James Wright. So James Wright, to me, is really one of the most interesting figures in Georgia history. He's really sort of a tragic figure in that he was born in London in 1716. His father was appointed Chief Justice of South Carolina when he was 14. He became uh, acting Attorney General and then Attorney General of South Carolina. He held that job for 10 years. He became colonial agent for South Carolina in London, and he was there when Henry Ellis resigned as the second colonial governor of Georgia, and so he was the perfect fit. He became the third, and it turned out, final colonial governor of the colony of Georgia. He came here, and he fully bought in to Georgia, and I mean that literally. He bought plantations, eventually 11 of them, 25,000 acres, 500 slaves, and he served the crown faithfully. He became a baronet in 1772, so he served James right after that. The revolution breaks out uh, in America, and he really tamps down the fires here as long as he can, but by 1776, he himself has to flee. 
the Morines and the Tattnalls helped him escape through Bonaventure Cemetery uh, to the safety of a British warship. In the struggle for independence, Bonaventure played another important role. In 1779, the land was used as a hospital treating French and Haitian troops under the command of French Count Charles d'Estaing after their defeat at the hands of the British at the first Siege of Savannah. Members of the Bonaventure Historical Society believe a number of these soldiers may be buried in unmarked graves at the cemetery. After the fall of Savannah in 1782, the new government labeled the Mulrines traitors for their role in Governor Wright's escape. As a result, the Mulrines left Bonaventure for the new province of Nassau in the Caribbean. For the Mulrins and Tattnall's loyalist actions, the new government of Georgia repossessed their home. Bonaventure would later be sold at auction and purchased by the Habersham family. Uh, James Habersham was an early settler uh, of Georgia. He came in the 1740s. Uh, he uh, ended up being the manager of uh, the Bethesda Orphan Home and through that was able to launch himself into a career as a merchant. Uh, he had enormous success as a merchant uh, once the trusteeship ended in the early 1750s. Uh, Habersham also accumulated property and became a, a significant planter. Uh, he had three sons, uh, uh, James II or James Jr., Joseph, and then the youngest, John Habersham. Uh, and as uh, the American Revolution approached, uh, all three of these sons became involved in, in the revolutionary movement. Uh, uh, James the uh, second, James Jr., uh, became a representative from the Savannah area and the, the Georgia Assembly. He also helped finance Georgia's participation in the Revolutionary War. Uh, both Joseph and John served in um, the, the military uh, uh, during the Revolution for the Patriots. Uh, in 1782, an opportunity opened up. Uh, the fighting was over. Savannah was uh, being evacuated. Charleston would soon be evacuated. Uh, and Georgia had passed a law uh, that allowed the confiscation of properties that had been owned uh, by uh, British loyalists uh, within the state. Uh, and among them uh, were considered to be the Tatman family. Uh, and uh, uh, John Habersham saw an opportunity to begin to expand the family's plantation empire uh, by purchasing uh, Tatnall's um, confiscated plantation by venture. Josiah Tatnall Jr. disagreed with his father and grandfather when it came to independence. He returned to America around 1782, joined the Continental Army, and rose to the rank of colonel before leaving the military. After buying the property back from John Habersham, Josiah Jr. became a prominent figure in Georgia history. He would go on to serve as governor of the state as well as holding many other positions. He would die young and leave the property to his son, Josiah Tatnall III, who would serve as Commodore in both the U.S. and Confederate navies. Once they uh, uh, regained control of Bonaventure, uh, the Tatnall family continued to use it as a plantation and continued to use the private cemetery uh, that was there. Uh, Josiah Tatnall III, the son of the Josiah Tatnall who repurchased Bonaventure, uh, became a career Navy officer. Uh, and over time, stationed in different places around the world, on different vessels uh, around the world, uh, voyaging to the Far East, voyaging to the Mediterranean, uh, he did not really have a direct connection to this property or to Savannah. Uh, in 1846, uh, the big house on uh, Bonaventure Plantation burned. Uh, and at that point, the Tatnall family concluded that maintaining this plantation uh, really would cost more and be more trouble than it was worth. So the Tatnalls sold Bonaventure Plantation to the Wiltbergers. Uh, who then continued to develop the cemetery uh, therein. 
Peter Wiltberger was a successful businessman in Savannah before buying Bonaventure from Tatnall. He owned a popular hotel in what is now the historic district of Savannah called the Pulaski House. The hotel was named after Polish Count Kazimir Pulaski, who died fighting with the Patriots during the second siege of Savannah. Wiltberger went to work immediately creating a new business known as the Evergreen Cemetery Company of Bonaventure. Under the watch of the Evergreen Company, Bonaventure began the transition from a plantation into a public cemetery. Not long after its purchase, the newly found cemetery gained its first prominent citizen. Wiltberger's wife, Susan, died shortly after her husband purchased the property and was interred at Bonaventure. Peter Wiltberger would join her six years later. Many other burials at this time included reinterments of notable Georgians, such as Noble Jones, who founded the Wormslow Plantation. Other popular Savannians interred during the time the Evergreen Company owned the cemetery include philanthropist Mary Telfair, the namesake for the Telfair Museums and the Mary Telfair Women's Center, former Evergreen President John Stoddard, and General Alexander Lawton, co-founder and former president of the American Bar Association. One of the more famous burials during the Evergreen tenure is that of Gracie Watson. Gracie, the six-year-old daughter of a manager at the Pulaski House, died of pneumonia. She was very popular among guests at the hotel, and she often enjoyed entertaining them. John Walls sculpted the young girl's famous monument from a picture, which depicts the child sitting serenely. In 1907, the city of Savannah bought the property from the Evergreen Company and renamed it Bonaventure Cemetery. The city took over the operations and maintenance of the site. In 1909, the Jewish congregation Mikvah Israel expanded the cemetery to include a section for Savannah's Jewish community. In 1917, the Daughters of Kindness of Loving Truth built the Jewish burial preparation facility and chapel. The cemetery also added a second gate to maintain the Jewish custom of not leaving through the same gate you entered. Many famous Savanians have been interred in the cemetery since the city bought it, including Grammy Award winning musician Johnny Mercer, and former U.S. Poet Laureate Conrad Aiken. According to local legend, Aiken had his marker fashioned like a bench to encourage tourists of the cemetery to join him and sit on his grave, although cemetery rules prevent visitors from entering grave sites without the express permission of lot owners. In 1986, the city of Savannah created the Department of Cemeteries that now oversees operations at Bonaventure. In 1994, Terry Shaw founded the Bonaventure Historical Society. The mission of the society is to encourage education about the cemetery and promote the preservation of the land. It does this through educational tours of the cemetery, which are free and open to the public. These tours highlight many of the people buried here, along with giving information on the land's past. During special events, the Society brings in volunteers to perform living history tours of the graveyard. The Bonaventure Historical Society works closely with the City of Savannah to keep the abandoned but historically important plots from falling into disrepair. In 2015, the Department of Cemeteries and the Historical Society joined forces to restore both the Wiltberger plots and that of Mayor Richard Arnold. Mayor Arnold is noted for his research on yellow fever and for saving Savannah by surrendering the city to General William T. Sherman in 1864. Recently, the Bonaventure Historical Society honored one of the cemetery's most distinguished internments. John Walls, the creator of many of the site's popular monuments, was buried in his wife's plot with no marker in 1922. In March 2015, the Historical Society dedicated a marker to the master sculptor. Much can be said for Bonaventure's beauty. Naturalist John Muir wondered at the splendor of the plants and animals present in Bonaventure and remarked that the dead do not rule this place alone. Later, Reverend G. Lewis visited Bonaventure on a recommendation from a friend. Lewis was astonished at what he referred to as the natural cathedral. Unlike Muir, however, 
Lewis saw Bonaventure as a region of shadow and spiritual death. These two stark comparisons of Bonaventure illustrate what all visitors may take away from a visit. Though it is easy to get lost in the beauty of the live oaks, flowers, and monuments, Bonaventure is a place of death. Tourists should remember to be respectful on their visits, as Bonaventure is the burial site of many people's loved ones. Bonaventure Plantation was one of the first founded in Georgia. It bore witness to the American Revolution and the breaking of ties with Great Britain. As a cemetery, the site became the final resting place of many prominent Savannah residents. Now, its picturesque views of the Wilmington River, beautiful avenues of oaks, and unique memorials make Bonaventure a tourist destination. Bonaventure truly is, as the Johnny Mercer song goes, too marvelous for words. <laughs>